Right, so this is uh, Chemistry 108, Chemical Principles 1 at York College. Um, we're continuing in Chapter 1. Today is February 10th, 2015. Okay, so before we get into the material, I, I want to uh, kind of remind you some of the th what I told you last time in recitation. So this is one of the recommended calculators. Remember, you're not allowed to use a graphing calculator. Um, and I recommended a couple of, or we recommended a couple of models in the syllabus. You don't have to get this one, right? But this I recommend because it's, at least when I looked, uh, kind of the cheapest uh, calculator that is widely available that's, that's going to do. So Casio FX260 Solar, um, probably about uh, 10 bucks if you go to like Staples or CVS or something, probably 20 bucks if you go to the bookstore. Um, <coughs> and it's solar, right, so you don't have to worry about running out of batteries. And it has everything you need. And some things that you don't, but that's OK. So how do I type, huh? OK, so I lost the name. How do I type 3.0 times 10 to the fourth into my calculator? So I'm going to type 3.0, right? So I'm going to do 3.0, and it's going to come up like this. And then I'm going to hit this button. EXP. On your calculator, and it might say EXP, depending on who makes it, right? It might say EXP, it might say E, it might say EE. -E. You might have to hit the shift button or the second function button to get it. <coughs> um, but you're going to hit the button that, that gives you that. What that means is times 10 to the power of. Right, so 3.0 is 3.0. Then to get times 10 to the power of, you hit the EXP button. And usually, on this well, on this calculator, it's going to give you something like this, right? <coughs> These small numbers over here. And then I'm going to type in my 4. So this is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the fourth. 3.0 EXP 4. What that means is 3.0 times 10 to the fourth. You don't need a, a multiplying sign. You don't need a caret, right? You don't need the. Uh, you don't need this thing, or you don't need the up arrow thing. This will do everything, and this will do it right every time. Right? If you use the, if you actually write out multiply ten exponent or caret four, sometimes that's going to mess up your order of operations, right? And so you're going to get the right answers, but the and usually what me that means is you're going to get the right answers for this part, but this part's going to be all wrong. So whenever you use your calculator to type in scientific notation, this is how you want to do it. What about negative 5.1 times 10 to the negative 12? So this is what on, on this simple calculator, this is what we're going to do. We're going to type in 5.1, right? And that's going to give me 5.1. 5.1. And then there's this plus minus sign. On your calculator, notice it's not the subtract sign. The subtract sign is going to mess you up. Here it's the plus minus sign. On some calculators, it'll be a little minus in parentheses. I press that button, and I get my big, my big, my big, huh? OK, the negative sign disappeared. I'm going to get my big negative sign. Over here, <coughs> I think the font color is not translating uh, onto the projector. So I'm going to do 5.1 plus minus. That's going to give me negative 5.1. Then I'm going to hit the EXP button. Once I hit the EXP button, I put in 12. I hit the plus minus key again, and that's going to make my exponent negative. So somehow the negative signs are not translating um, correctly. But there's a negative sign here and the negative sign here. Right? Let's see. 
OK, that's because um, negative 12th means there's a ton of zeros, and so it's not going to fit on your screen. Right, so most calculators, unless you tell it to do it explicitly, it's going to try to fit them onto the screen. And if it doesn't fit onto the screen, it'll put it into scientific notation. If you, you, you might not want it to fit on the screen. Right? You might not want to write down like six zeros, because that'll fit on your screen. There's ways, depending on your calculator, how to force it to always give you scientific notation. We can look at that later. If you have a different calculator, it doesn't quite work for you, come see me, and we'll get that. We'll you know, look at how to use your particular model as well. OK, so let's do some chemistry. We're going to do a couple more examples, because <coughs> um, this conversion thing with dimensional analysis, um, with multiplying and dividing and uh, crossing out, that's really the guts of how you're going to solve probably three quarters of the problems that you do in this class, the three quarters of the mathematical problems you do in this class. So we got to make sure that you understand it. So let's do this, another problem. 360 seconds to the minus 1 over 2. The first thing I want to point out, or the first thing I want to ask is, What does that mean? Exponent minus 1. Oh, 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 take out your card if you got your card. <coughs> and You can go over your name in dark marker if, uh, if it's light. You can pass the marker around if you need it. <coughs> OK, so what is this exponent minus 1? What does that mean? Or what does a negative exponent mean? It's 1 divided by. If you see the negative, it's 1 divided by. So if I said 10 to the minus 2, what that equals is 1 over 10 squared. The negative exponent means that we flip it and put it into the denominator. So what does seconds to the minus 1 mean? Equals 1 over 1 over seconds. And then I want to convert that over to hours to the minus 1, right? That means 1 over hours. Does anyone have an idea what 1 over seconds measures? Well, there's no distance, right? Dist 1 over meters over second or something, miles over second, gives us speed. <coughs> some of you um, have some experience thinking about this, even if you don't know it. Has anyone ever heard of a unit called Hertz? Yeah. yeah. Where did you? Where have you heard that before? Electric. Sorry. Electric. Your electri electricity, your computer or your phone, right? <coughs> when it's talking about the speed of the processor, it's talking. It tells you usually gigahertz or, or megahertz. <coughs> um, hertz is a repetition rate. How many times something happens? every second. <coughs> right. The numerator is, there is no numerator. It's not meters per second. It's not miles per second. It's just something happened per second. Something happened this many times per second. So <coughs> when you talk about like gigahertz on your phone, that means your phone is able to process that many calculations or that many steps per second. Right, so the more higher the gigahertz, the faster your, your phone works. So let's convert 300 seconds to the minus 1 over to hours to the minus 1. <coughs> and 
Let's do it this way. Let's put our heads together gently with uh, our neighbor or our friend. If you don't have friends, make some. And, um, and let's, let's see what you can come up with. Okay, so one over seconds. Um, the way to do this, or one way to do this, is to go first from seconds to minutes, and then from minutes on to hours. Right, if, you, if you know how to do it all at once, that's okay, but I'm going to do it in steps. Right, so 360 times 1 over seconds. The seconds is in the denominator. Right, that means if I want to cancel it with a conversion factor, how do I cancel it? Where does the seconds have to be? Five. On top. Right, the seconds needs to be on top. So, seconds, and first I'm going to go from seconds to minutes. How many seconds in a minute? 60. Very good, 60 seconds in one minute. <coughs> and when I do that cancellation, now if I were to stop here, what uh, would I get? I would get one over minutes. But I'm, I'm not stopping at minutes. I want to go from 1 over minutes to 1 over hours. Right, so how am I going to go from 1 over minutes to 1 over hours? I need my minutes on top and my hours on the bottom. So 60 minutes in 1 hour. When I cancel that, I'm going to get minutes and minutes. And what's left? 1, not hours, 1 over hours. Hours is still in the denominator. Right, so I'm going to do 360 times 60 times 60, and if I think I, I if I, it's 129, how many zeros? Zero, zero, zero? Three zeros. Or 1.29 times 10 to the fifth? Nine, six. 1.296. Three zeros times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1.296 times 10 to the 6, hours to the minus 1. Uh, um, we haven't talked about significant figures yet, so that's why I left it as is. And so we would say 1.3 times 10 to the 6, hours to the minus 1. Yeah. So when you move the decimal point to the left, the mm -hmm. exponent is positive. When you move it to the right, it's negative? Uh, it depends where you move it from, right? Um, so this number, it's big, mm -hmm. right? So if numbers are big, bigger than 1, the exponent's going to be positive. If numbers are decimal, smaller than 1, right, they're going to be negative. The exponent is going to be negative. So let's say you have point. Yeah. You move it to get it eight to eight. You're moving it to the right, right? So that would be minus one, minus two, uh, minus three. Right. When you say which way you move it, it, it can be tricky because if you're moving it from here to go that way, it's one direction. If you're moving it from here to go that way, it's the other direction. So the way I I would think about it is numbers that are big bigger than 1, get positive exponents. Numbers that are less than 1 get negative exponents. Right, that's, that's sort of not going to, once you wrap your head around that, that's not going to confuse you. right? Because you, sometimes you have to go from here to here, sometimes you have to go from here to here. And you'll be like, wait, right, left, wait, which one? <coughs> so if you go from the bottom of your head to the top, it's yeah. negative. Well, this is, <laughs> see, that, 10 to the 6th means it's a big number, right? So that means it's this, right? So you're going to move it this way. <coughs> um, yeah, and if it was negative, you would move it that way. Okay, so um, questions here? Other questions here? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Because h to the negative 1 is the same as what? 1 over h. 
Right? That's what the negative one means. So you could just leave it as long. Yeah. Or you could or you could also put one over h if you want. That's that's equivalent. <coughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. What was your other question? Okay, so we're going to, here's the one you did in recitation, or you at least attempted to do in recitation. Whoops, I'll leave it on. 3.77 grams over centimeters cubed to kilograms over meters cubed. All right, that's what you did on Thursday. I don't think we got an answer, did we? We did? Okay, so let's do a different one. Okay, so 3.77 times 10 to this 10 squared centimeters per second <coughs> over to kilometers or kilometers per kilosecond. Kilosecond is sort of a strange unit, but there's nothing wrong with it. Right, we can put a kilo in front of a second. And so what kind of property are we measuring here? Sorry? It's distance over time. So that's a, that's a speed or a rate or something. <coughs> oh, 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 I remember what I was going to say. Before we move on from this one, someone asked me uh, while I was going around the room, this is a really big number, right? <coughs> Shouldn't the number get smaller? And I didn't really have time to explain, and I wanted to explain to everyone. Does it make sense that this number gets bigger? Remember, what does 1 over second mean? It means I do something occurs this many times every second. If something occurs this many times every second, what's going to happen when I think about how many times it occurs every hour? It's going to be a lot bigger, right? And so this makes sense. OK. Now put your heads together gently, and let's do it. Okay, so um, let's 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 put it together. So there's two ways I can. <coughs> I want to go from centimeters to km, right? And there's um, the way I like to do it is to go from centimeters to meters, and then from meters to <coughs> kilometers. And so I can do my cm to m two ways, right? A hundred centimeters equals one meter. Or I can do 1 centimeter equals 1 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Either of these will work just fine. And the same thing for the km, right? So let's uh, do this out. <coughs> Remember, you're going to have to know how many k is in an m and how many c and how many m and all that stuff, right, in your table. OK. so. 3.77 times 10 squared centimeters per second. <coughs> because centimeters are on top, we can do that first. We don't have to. We could do the seconds first if we wanted to. Centimeters to meters. What? Where is the centimeters going to go and where is meters? Centimeters is on bottom. Meters is on top. <coughs> and so. If I do 1 me centimeter equals 1 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. <coughs> if I want, I could also do 101. Both of them work exactly the same. 
So, centimeters and centimeters cancel. I get, now if I stopped here, what would my unit be? I see. I see, yeah, yeah. One second. If I stopped here, what would my unit be? Meters per second, yeah. You can just write 10 to the negative 2. I write it like this because how are you going to put this into your calculator? This is going to go into your calculator if you do it on your calculator. 1 e negative 2. Right, because 10 to the negative 2 is 1 times 10 to the negative 2 in terms of what you put in your calculator. <coughs> okay, so we've got meters per second. We don't want meters per second. We want to get to km, right, kilometers. Can I get from m to km? Yes, I can. How do I do that? What goes here? What goes here? Remember, one step at a time. Right. I see some of you trying to do something with km over s and s over c and one step at a time. Right. <coughs> Centimeters to meters, meters to k kilometers. Uh, 1 km equals 1 times 10 to the third or 1,000 meters. And when I do that, I'm going to cancel meters and meters. Now if I stop here, I get km per s second. Right kilometers per second. Last thing I want to do is change my seconds to kiloseconds. And so how am I going to do that? A thousand seconds. So where's the seconds going to go here? The seconds goes on top. Right? That's just like this question down here with the 1 over seconds. The seconds is in the, de the denominator. So when I cancel it, the seconds goes in the numerator. Seconds over kiloseconds, <coughs> one, sec uh, one kilosecond equals one times ten to the third seconds. Seconds and seconds cancel. And so what's the unit that I'm left with here? Kilometers over kiloseconds. And I get 3.77 times 10 to the 0, or just 3.77 km over ks. <laughs> Very good, princess. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. No. OK. <laughs> yes, Leo. You, you, you do look like him. <laughs> OK, so I got 10 to the 0. Um, this is 10 to the 2. When I multiply, I add the exponent, right? So 2 plus minus negative 2 is going to give me 0. When I divide, I subtract, right? So 0 minus 3 gives me negative 3. When I multiply, I add negative 3 plus 3 equals 0. So it doesn't look like you just do 1 km over 10 to the centimeters? You could do that, right? Because you could, if you wanted to, you could do, you could combine meters, centimeters to meters, and then meters to km, if you know how to do that, if that makes sense to you. Again, I like to do it step by step so I don't get confused, but if you're happy with that, that's fine. Other questions? Okay, very good. So, let's take a step back into temperature. So, <coughs> temperature is one instance, one of the very few instances where you won't be using dimensional analysis, where you won't be using this kind of crossing out thing <coughs> to convert between units. So temperature, remember, is a measure of the hotness or coldness of an object. 
And it, temperature comes in three different uh, flavors, right? <coughs> um, Kelvin, degrees Celsius, or degrees Fahrenheit. And Kelvin is actually the SI unit for temperature. And you can have millikelvin and microkelvin and kilokelvin and so on. And as long as you're using the metric system within the Kelvin scale, you do it with dimensional analysis, the way we just uh, the way we just looked at it. But if you're converting between Kelvin and degrees Celsius, or Kelvin and Fahrenheit, or Fahrenheit and Celsius, you're not, right? And this is one of the few instances where you're not. And the reason you can kind of see here, <coughs> because the zero points are different. And in order to do, do dimensional analysis, one of the most uh, one of the requirements is that zero is zero, right? Zero meters is the same as zero millimeters, is the same as zero kilometers, is the same as zero miles, same as zero feet, right? <coughs> but here, the, the, the zero points are all different, right? And so you can't convert directly through multiplying by a conversion factor. <coughs> the way it's written here, we're looking at two important temperatures, and they're Important temperatures, one, because we are familiar with them, right? We're familiar with water, the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. And two, because they're very, th they're, they illustrate what's going on, right? So the one that we m use most often in daily life, right? If you listen to the temperature on the radio or, <coughs> you know, you check weather.com or whatever, 32 is a temperature at which water freezes in degrees Fahrenheit. 212 is the temperature at which water boils in degrees Fahrenheit. Right, and today it was, it was supposed to reach like 36 or something like that, 35, 36, some of that ice may, might melt. Right, that's in degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, which is what you typically use in the Chem 109 lab, <coughs> water freezes at zero and boils at 100. And in the Kelvin scale, water freezes at 273 and boils at 373. So the first conversion that we're going to look at is Celsius to Kelvin. What's the difference between 0 and 100? 100 minus 0 is 100. What's the difference between 373 and 273? Also 100. So what that tells you is the number of steps between water freezing and water boiling, in both cases, is 100. Right? So the steps are the same size. It's just that to get from here to here, what do you need to do? You need to add 273. 0 to 273 is 0 plus 273. 100 to 373 is also plus 273. Right? And here is normal body temperature. Right? Those of you going into the medical field or just a few you know, take your temperature when you get sick. So 98.6 Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius is normal body temperature. 37 plus 273, 310. Right, so to get from Celsius to Kelvin, you're going to add 273. What if I want to get from Kelvin over to Celsius? Subtract 273, very good. So Kelvin to Celsius, degrees Celsius to Kelvin. N Kelvin to degrees Celsius is Kelvin minus 273 gives you degrees Celsius. That's pretty straightforward. It gets a little more, a little hairier when you go from Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. <coughs> because 100 steps here, 32 to 212. How many steps there? 212 minus 32 is 180. Right, so there's more steps in the Fahrenheit scale to, to cover the same distance, means each step is smaller. Right? And so before we do any, <coughs> so, so in addition to doing some adding and subtracting, we're going to have to do something about the size of the steps. Before we do that, let's do an example. What is the equivalent of 298, on the Celsius, 298 Kelvin on the Celsius scale? Right, how do I get from Kelvin to Celsius? Subtract. So. 298 minus 273, 
it's going to give me 25. Are we happy? No, we're not. Well, why are we not happy? Because, well, we need a unit, right? So 25 degrees Celsius equals 298 Kelvin. We can't just leave this hanging out <coughs> without a unit. So number unit, number unit. Both of them have a number and a unit. OK, so here's our, our picture again. Right, and so here we're going from 0 to 100. Here we're going from 32 to 212. Here it's 100 degrees. Here it's 180 degrees. So if I look at 180, if I put it, if I make myself a fraction, 180 over 100, and I reduce that, that's going to reduce, well, I can reduce those. 18 over 10 is going to reduce to 9 over 5. And if I look at 100 over 180, that's going to reduce to 5 over 9. So these two fractions are going to be important when we're converting Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. So here's the formula for converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. If I have degrees Celsius, I'm going to multiply by 9 divided by 5, or 1.8 if you want, and then add 32. The multiplying by 9.5, the 9 divided by 5, that takes care of the different size in the steps. And then adding 32 accounts for the offset between 0 degrees Celsius and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now if I wanted, whoops, okay, so let's leave that there for now. <coughs> if I want to do, that's if I want to do blah, 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 Celsius to Fahrenheit. So let's do an example. If it is 30 degrees Celsius outside, what is the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? Okay, so, <laughs> just kidding. So here's the formula. <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths times degrees Celsius plus 32, right? <coughs> and I know the degree Celsius, temperature in degrees Celsius, it's 30 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to plug that in. Fahrenheit equals 9 divided by 5 times 30 plus 32. And 9 divided by 5 times 30 is going to be 54, right? 54 plus 32 is going to give me degrees Fahrenheit equals 86. 86 degrees Fahrenheit equals 30 degrees Celsius. <coughs> now, if only it were that warm outside. Questions here? And by the way, I put up uh, slides for uh, the lectures up to last Thursday. I put them up on Blackboard uh, over the weekend. So you can get those and review them if you want. And then these will be coming up soon. Questions here? So if I want to take this formula and I want to isolate degrees Celsius, right? If I get degrees Celsius on one side by itself, then I've got the formula for the other conversion. <coughs> and so those of you who are kind of more mathematically inclined, you can try to figure this out. What are you going to do? You're going to do subtract 32 from both sides, <coughs> and then you're going to multiply by 5 ninths, right? So what we're going to get is degrees Celsius equals 5 ninths times degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. Now, if you don't see the exact math, I'm not going to go over it right now, but we can go over it, uh, come to my office, and we can go through how to get it. 
um, degrees Celsius equals 5 ninths times F minus 32. So the F minus 32 takes you from 32 basically down to 0. <coughs> and then the 5 ninths gives you the scaling right, between <coughs> the smaller, more numerous units here and the larger, less numerous units here. So if you have a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, what is your temperature in Celsius? Here's the formula again. 104 is a you know, fairly bad fever. So what are we going to do? We're going to plug in degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 ninths. So 104 minus 32 gives me 72, if I'm not mistaken. 72 times 5 ninths equals 40. So 40 degrees Celsius equals 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, we have on both our statements here a number and a unit. Questions here? Okay, if there's no questions at this point, we'll take a 10 minute break. Now we will finally use those handouts that I asked you to bring last Thursday when we come back from break. <coughs> okay, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, significant figures, uh, also known as what I like to call uncertainty in measurement. And Because students like to ask, why do we have to know significant figures? And the reason is because this isn't a math class. This is a class in science. Right? And so our numbers have some, it's a you know, chemistry is, is, is the study of matter. The numbers that we use have some basis in physical reality. right? <coughs> um, if you're in math class, 3.72 is just 3.72. But <coughs> in chemistry, 3.72 meters is a certain distance. And it's 3.72 because we measure 3.72. We didn't measure 3.7. We didn't measure 3.8. We didn't measure 3.722. We measured 3.72. And so some numbers are exact. While others are inexact. Right? And so this is, what does that mean? So exact numbers are numbers that we can count. I have five fingers on my hand. Right? There's no question that there's five fingers on my hand, even though you know <coughs> when I'm driving, maybe you'll only see one of them. Um, there's exactly 12 eggs in a dozen. Right? That we know by definition. Thank you. Somebody laughed. Um, <coughs> there's, by definition, a dozen means 12. Right, so if I buy a dozen eggs, I buy 12 eggs. There's no question that there's 12. There's actually more than six seats in the front row. There's eight seats in the front row. Six of them are empty. Right, the eight seats and the six empty ones are not, there's no uncertainty. Exactly 100 cents in a dollar and so on. Right? So exact numbers are def determined either by definition or by counting. Right, and so. What's another example of an exact number that you can think of? Number of students. Number of students. In this class, there are 57 or so students. 57. I think it's 57. <coughs> um, but I could go to my roster and count them 1 to 57. You got two ears, right? I mean, there, there, there's 31 days in January. There's lots of diff exact numbers. So what are inexact numbers? Inexact numbers are numbers that we obtain by measurement. Right? And so um, <coughs> by the way, let's, let's take a step back. Your prefixes in terms of The metric system, those are exact numbers. Right? There's exactly 100 centimeters in one meter. There's exactly 1,000 km in one 
one meter. Those are by definition. Numbers obtained by measurement, on the other hand, are inexact. And I'll show you what I mean. <coughs> well, and, and why are they inexact? It depends first on the instrument, right? If you are <coughs> measuring with a, a really, quote, good ruler, for example, you might be able to measure two decimal places. If you're measuring with a really crude ruler, you might be able to measure no decimal places. So it depends on the instrument, and it depends on the person. Right? It depends on how good you are, if you're making the instrument, how good, <coughs> how good you are at reading the instrument that you're, that you're using. So I'll give you an example. Who heard the weather report this morning? And how, what, what did they say? How, how, how hot or how cold was it going to be today? 36 degrees. OK. And so if you went outside and you said, well, it's 36 degrees, is it, well, huh, this was for the spring. I mean, this was for the fall, right? When <laughs> if I ask the question, how hot is it outside, I'm really asking, what's the temperature of the air, right? And we could say 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Is it really 75 or really 36? Well, it depends. Is it, it might be, uh, is it 75.4? Is it 75.43? Is it, wait, it could be any or all of them. And we couldn't, if it was, if we had the most precise thermometer that we could imagine and we got something like this, we couldn't really say that this is wrong, right? We re couldn't really say that these are wrong but we could say that this is more right, right? It depends on what? It depends on how good a thermometer we're using. And also, from a more philosophical sense, it depends on what we want to use that number for, right? <coughs> um, if I just want to know whether I should wear shorts <coughs> or, or pants, this is all I need to know, right? I don't need to know this. So there's no reason to buy a thermometer that's going to measure this if all I need to know is whether I'm going to wear shorts or pants. <coughs> so here's an example, right? Here's three thermometers. Here's, a, and you could imagine each of these three, right? So here's <coughs> one that's marked every 10 degrees. Here's one that's marked every 10 degrees, but it has these one degree units in between. And here's a digital one. Press the button, and it gives me a temperature. So what's the temperature? Who thinks it's 74? Who thinks it's 75? Who thinks it's 76? Who thinks it's 77? Who thinks it's something else? So I'm going to say it's 70, I don't know, 75, I think is what I wrote. I'm going to say it's 75. <coughs> if you said it's 76, unless I took another measuring instrument, like a ruler, and measured between 70 and 80, I couldn't say that 76 is wrong. I couldn't say that 75 is wrong. What do I know for certain? I know for certain it's between 70 and 80, and I kind of know it's toward the middle, somewhere 75, 76. So if I'm using this thermometer, I have no basis in physical reality, no basis in my measuring tool to say it's 75.5 or 75.8 or 76.2, right? Because I don't even know if it's 75 or 76. I can't make a more precise measurement than that. So this measurement then has two significant digits or significant figures. Why are they significant? because they have a basis in reality based on the tool that I'm using. What about this one? 95. Okay, so someone raise their hand and tell me what they think. Okay, so, um, yes, Princess. 75.5. 75. 75. 
Just because she's a princess doesn't mean you have to agree with her. Yes, Caitlin. 75.4. 75.4. Yes, no name tag. 75.3. 75.3. Any other guesses? Any other? Yes, Leo. 75. 75. Sorry? 75.8. OK, so what do I know? I know for certain it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, between 75 and 76. But beyond that, I can't say any of you are wrong. Right? It could be, unless I take another instrument and measure, right? in which case I'm kind of cheating. right? So <coughs> I'm going to say it's 75.4, because that's what I think it is. <coughs> um, but if you said it's 75.5, I'm not going to say it's, I can't tell you you're, you're incorrect. So what do I know? I know two digits for certain, one digit that's I'm estimating. I'm estimating it so it still has a basis in physical reality. So based on this, I get three significant digits in my measurement. Let's say it was, instead of going there, it was right here. What would I get? If it was here, I, all I would get is 70, because I have no way of measuring tenths. right? But if it was here, it would be 70.0. If you put 70 and 70.0 into your calculator, your calculator is going to think it's the same thing. But it's not in terms of chemistry. Because 70 means you use this crummy, crummy uh, thermometer. 70.0 means you use this very much nicer thermometer. And then if I turn this on, 75.43, <coughs> there's something in there measuring temperature. Right? This is not magic. So this has four significant digits. <coughs> so when you're making, when you're in the lab in Chem 109, and you're, for example, looking at your graduated cylinder, <coughs> if you see this in your graduated cylinder, and this is milliliters instead of degrees Celsius, what's that going to be? That's going to be 75 point something. OK. The digits of a measured quantity, including one that we're not sure of, right? We're not sure of that one. Those are significant. Anything beyond that is going to be insignificant. So what are <coughs> that comes to the rules for significant figures. And that's what's on your handout. Why do we need rules for significant figures? Because if you, a lot of times when you do a calculation in your, in your calculator, if you start with three significant digits, and you multiply it by something else with three significant digits, your calculator is going to give you like 18 digits. Right? And not all of those 18 digits have a physical basis in reality, or a basis in physical reality. Right? Here, only these three digits have a basis in physical reality. And what the significant figures, calculations, and definitions, and stuff that we're going to go over, what that does is help us to make sure that our calculated values reflect real life, and not just the math on our calculator. So rules for significant figures. All non-zero digits are significant. If you see a 372.44, 372 all those digits are significant. So all zero non-zero digits are significant. What does that mean? That means the rest of the rules we're going to be looking at have to do with what number? Zeros. Determining whether the zeros in our number are significant, that is, have some basis in physical reality, or don't. How many significant figures? Four. Four. Right. Zeros between non-zero digits are significant. So what does that mean? That means in a number like 808.3, this zero is significant. <coughs> that means it's that zero is telling us that it's not 818 or 828, it's 808. That zero has meaning. So between non-zero digits, they're significant. If I were to write this, <coughs> 
327.03. This zero, forget about the decimal point when we're thinking about this, is between two non-zero digits. It's also significant. 327.0304 between non-zero digits, significant. Zeros at the beginning of a number are not significant. So, if I were to change this to this, this zero at the beginning of a number, not significant. This zero, also at the beginning of a number, not significant. This zero, significant. Some more examples, I think. So 0 0.035. Those two leading zeros are insignificant because they're at the beginning of a number. <coughs> they're insignificant because they're just, they're placeholders, right? They're not telling us, <coughs> if we were using a, a ruler, right, all we have to do is kind of shrink down our ruler and we get these two numbers over here. <coughs> or if this was meters and I converted it to centimeters, right, what would I do? Multiply by 100, I get 3.5. Right, those zeros disappear. So insignificant zeros at the beginning of a number. So that has two significant digits. Okay, so this is kind of like that one. How many significant digits are in this number? Four. Four, very good. This zero is significant. These zeros are not significant. And so this has four significant digits. Question so far? Zeros at the end of a number are significant if there is a decimal point in the number. 3.0. <coughs> that zero is significant because there is a decimal point. In other words, whoever was making the measurement or writing your question took the time to write 3.0. That means the point zero means something. It's not 3.1, it's not 3.2, it's 3.0. So this has two significant fi digits. Sorry? Well, that means it's 3.00000. They're all significant. zeros at the end of a number are not significant if there's no decimal point. So what does that mean? That zero is not significant. There's no decimal point. <coughs> this can be confusing. So what's the best way, if you have a zero at the end, to make your point? Any ideas? Whether it's significant or not. Let's say the answer really is 320. Right? You do a calculation and your answer with the correct significant digits is 320. There's two ways to force this to be significant. You can put the decimal at the end. So I can write it like this, 320 point and nothing after that. That's kind of strange, right? Nobody does that outside of uh, out of scientists. Yeah. Well, 32.0, but then it's not 320 anymore. But you're on the right track. Very good. I can put it in scientific notation. 3.20 times 10, 10 to the what? 2. Right. That means there's three significant figures. If I were to write 3.2 times 10 to the 2, that would mean there's two significant figures. Right? And so 
choosing to write this or this forces me to, to, to realize there's either three or two significant figures. So, if I wrote 320 dot, that would force me to say <coughs> the zero is significant because of the decimal point ru rule, right? If the number has a decimal point, the zeros are significant. And the other way is this, right? 3.20 times 10 to the 2 <coughs> forces this zero to be significant also because of the decimal point rule. Questions? Okay, so what about calculations? So, right, those, that's a summary of the, the rules. It's on your sheet, so what about calculations, right? Calculations is where it kind of becomes important. How do I know how to report my answer so that my answer reflects what is really going on, right, in terms of my measurements? This is kind of a, a, a general principle. Your least certain measurements, if you have a whole bunch of measurements and you're combining them in some calculation, the one that has the least certainty limits my answer. Right, so if I have <coughs> um, one measurement, in other words, if I have one measurement where I use the really, really good, good thermometer, right? and a second measurement where I use the really, really cheap thermometer, the lousy one. When I add those two together, my answer is going to be determined, or the, m the, the, the certainty, or how good my answer is, is going to be de limited by the one time I used the, the lousy thermometer. Right, because if I have one question with a lot of, one measurement with a lot of uncertainty and another measurement with a little uncertainty, I combine them together, what's it going to look like? Well, the little uncertainty is going to kind of get washed out and I'm going to be left with the big uncertainty. Right, so, <coughs> rule for multiplication and division. The answer has to contain the same number of significant figures as the measurement with the fewest significant figures. So, Back to our volume example, length times width times height. <coughs> if I do a calculation, right, I have, I made some measurements on a box. My box is 3.21 times 5.017 by 10.401 centimeters. <coughs> the unit here is going to be what? Centimeters cubed. Right, and when I type this into my calculator, I type in 3.21 times 5.017 times 10.401. I'm going to get this. You can try it. If you write this down, your answer is not correct because that does, does not reflect what these mean physically, right? what these mean as measurements. It only reflects what they mean as numbers. I'm going to have to think about my significant figure rules. So. I want my answer, I need to round my answer off so that my answer has the same number of significant figures as the measurement with the fewest significant figures. So, this one has three. How many significant figures here? Four. And how many here? Five. So, how many digits or how many digits should where should I round this one? Should have three, because three is the fewest. So how do I round this to three significant figures? Yes, so I'm going to just keep the first, second, and third. So that means I'm going to round off starting here. <coughs> 5.5036 is greater than half, right? So that rounds up. And I get 168 centimeters cubed. Questions here?
Okay. Number in a unit. So, rule two is for addition and subtraction. The answer has the same number of decimal places as the measurement with the fewest decimal places. It's a little different. In, the t <coughs> in multiplication and division, which we looked at in the last slide, we're counting the total number of significant digits. Here, we're just counting decimal places. That is, digits to the right of the decimal point. So I bought, went to the store, I bought some jewelry, 98.4 grams, one that's 8.125 grams, and one that's 0.88 grams. How much did I get in total? Well, these are measured values, right? <coughs> and because they're measured values, they're not exact. So when I do my addition, this plus this plus this, and I put it on my, in on my calculator, I'm going to get this, 107.405. That's not correct, right? It's only correct in terms of the numbers, but not in terms of physically what I'm adding up. So for addition and subtraction, I'm going to think about the measurement with the fewest decimal places. Right, so how many decimal places here? One. One. How many here? Three. How many here? Three. Right. And so, one is the smallest out of these, right? So I'm going to round this off to one decimal place. So I'm going to round off up to the first decimal place, and I'm going to get 107.4 grams. Questions? Okay, good. Number in unit, okay. <coughs> okay, just for completion, right? So pre precision and accuracy in measurement. Precision is how closely individual measurements agree with each other. <coughs> um, accuracy, how close individual measurements are to the correct or true answer, right? And so here we have poor accuracy, but good precision. Here we have good accuracy and good precision. Here we have someone who doesn't know how to play darts. <coughs> um. Okay. Question so far? Okay. Let's just make these a little more normal. Okay. Let's do this problem over here. Significant figures. 321.4 km plus 1.13 km divided by 5.466 hours plus 2.23 hours. So this is going to give us <laughs> kilometers per hour. Except now we're putting stuff all together, right? We're doing some addition, and some more addition, and then some division. 5.466 hours plus 2.23 hours. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to do these stepwise. 
let's do the numerator first. 321.4 hours plus 1.13 hours. And that's going to give me 322.53 hours, right? Kilometers. Top. Oh, kilometers, yeah. Kilometers. Is that correct? No. It's, why is it not correct? It only has one decimal place, right? Because addition and subtraction is the answer has the same number of decimal places as the one with the fewest decimal places. So the fewest decimal place is one. So this is going to be 322.5, right? So 322.5 kilometers. <coughs> and what about my hours? So I'm going to do 5.466 hours plus 2.23 hours, 696, 7.696 hours. But do I need to do some rounding? Yes, I have to round off to how many decimal places? Two, right? Because this is two, this is three. Two is smaller than three. How am I going to round this to two decimal places? Seven point point seven zero hours, right? The six rounds up. You round up a nine to the next higher number, which is going to be basically ten, right? So seven point seven zero hours. Okay, so <coughs> what am I going to get here? What do you get when you plug it in on your calculator? Louder, sorry. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so is this correct? No, how many, where are we going to round it? To how many? Three. three. This has three significant figures. The zero is significant, right? And because there's a decimal place, this is four. So how am I going to round this to three? 41.9. So this is wrong, right? So it's 41.9 kilometers per hour. Questions? Okay, so you think you got it. Now do go home and do 10,000 problems <coughs> um, or until Alex ask, asks you to stop, <coughs> and which may, may actually be more than 10,000. <coughs> um, in the meantime, nope, I have another uh, eight minutes and I intend to use them. You had your break already. <coughs> OK, so this is whoops. This is now chapter two. And so the way I like to think about chapter two <coughs> is we're going to learn about atoms and elements. We're going to learn about molecules and compounds. Right, that's not the exact title of the chapter, but this is the way I like to think about it. Right, atoms, elements, molecules, and compounds. And I like to think about it as having, looking at the world at two different ways. Right, so one is the kind of big world, the world that we kind of walk and act and, and live in. And one world that's very, very small, right? The big world is what we might call the macroscopic world, right? I can, and when we talk about matter on the macroscopic level, like we did in chapter one, 
we think about like water or, 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 or a bottle. When we think about very, very small, we think about the fundamental building blocks of matter. And those are things that are we're going to call atoms and molecules. Macroscopic, submicroscopic. So the big view of the world says matter is the stuff that's all around us. Very the submicroscopic view says matter is made up of atoms and molecules. Right, atoms and molecules are way too small for us to see by any sort of normal means. <coughs> and so on the very, very small scale, matter is made up of atoms and molecules. In the macroscopic scale, matter is made up of elements and compounds. Right, so in some sense, elements basically correspond to atoms and compounds basically correspond to molecules, although there are some exceptions there. Right. <coughs> That's not a hard and fast m rule. We're going to see some molecular elements. <coughs> but basically, that's, that's the way it works. And so what are elements and compounds? And what are atoms and molecules? Well, elements are substances, types of matter, that cannot be decomposed or cannot be broken down into simpler substances by sort of ordinary chemical means. Compounds, <coughs> and so that means there's only, what's the correlation between elements and atoms? In elements, you only have one type of atom, and that atom is not connected to any other atoms. Well, no, only one type of atom. We'll, we'll leave it there. Compounds can be decomposed or can be broken down into simpler substances. And compounds are made up of molecules that contain more than one atom joined together, more than one type of atom joined together. <coughs> So, we think about something like water, and many people, even without taking chemistry, know that water somehow is H2O, right? And they know that H is hydrogen and O is oxygen. So water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, right? But, and, and so water is made up of molecules of water that contain hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Water, however, is quite different from hydrogen. It's quite different from oxygen. It's quite different than if you just took a cylinder full of hydrogen and a cylinder full of oxygen and mixed them together. Right. That's because they're joined together as molecules. So here's a schematic, right? Here's one way of looking at atoms of an element. Here's another one way of looking at molecules of a compound. We don't know what these colors mean <laughs> in terms of the identity and so on, but here you have each sphere represents one atom of the element that's red. Here you have these spheres joined together. <coughs> and in each molecule, you have one atom that's purple and three atoms that are green. So you have atoms of an element and molecules of a compound. Now, you <coughs> some examples helium, we have a lady helium somewhere in this room, um, neon, and so on, iron. Molecules of a compound, right? So examples, water, right? H2O, carbon dioxide. These are things that we've heard of, even if you haven't take, taken chemistry. CO2. <coughs> we also have in the middle here what are called molecules of an element. What's the difference between this and this and this? They're molecules because they're two joined together. But they're not a compound because there's only one color, right? There's only one type of atom. They just happen to be joined together. So molecules of an element 
molecular elements, that's the exception I talked about, I mentioned very briefly earlier, the oxygen we breathe could be represented like this, right, O2. Nitrogen, that's also in the air, could be represented N2, yeah. Yeah, so diatomic, so, so you know something that I haven't taught you yet, which is okay, it's not illegal. <coughs> so these are what are called diatomic elements. That means there's two atoms in one molecule. <coughs> um, there's other examples that are not diatomic, right? <coughs> um, so sulfur, for example, can be S8. There's a form of oxygen called ozone, that's O3. Right? And so there's different types of molecules of an element. <coughs> um, Basically here you have an overview of all the different types of matter that exist. <coughs> okay, so I guess I'm out of time here. And so next Tuesday, a week from today, we'll pick up uh, where we left off.